Okay? Exodus 24. God says to Moses, Climb up the mountain to God, you and Aaron, Nada, Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. Now, in the book of Numbers, he mentions these 70 elders. But, obviously, before you get to the book of Numbers, they're already there. They're here in Exodus 24. Now, where did, where did they come from? Back in chapter 18, uh, Jethro had told Moses to appoint elders of five, uh, sorry, tens, fifties, hundreds, thousands, and to find leaders and appoint them over these groups. So he's got this group of leaders, and here, and it's 70 of the leaders of Israel. They will worship from a distance, only Moses will approach God. The rest are not to come close, the people are not to climb the mountain at all. So Moses went to the people and told them everything God said, all the rules and regulations. They all answered in unison, everything God said, we'll do. Okay? Then Moses wrote it down, uh, everything God had said. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain using 12 pillar stones for the 12 tribes of Israel. By the way, uh, in the, tr the traditional place where Mount Sinai is, you know, it's near the bottom of the peninsula, the Sinai Peninsula. But some people are saying that really Mount Sinai is over on the other side of the Gulf of Aqaba, and that there is the mountains of Midian there, and it's there. Somebody has found 12 standing stones in a circle and said, this is that. Okay. Now we're not sure whether it is that because see, is it this or is it, it 12 also can stand for, you know, 12 signs of the zodiac or 12, you know, things like this. Is this uh, the same thing that most built or not? But it's interesting that something like this has been found. Then he directed young Israelite men to offer whole burnt offerings to sacrifice peace offerings and boats. Most took half the blood and put it on the poles. The other half he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. I read, sorry, read it as the people. Listen, they said, again, everything God said, we'll do. Yes, we'll obey. Moses took the rest of the blood and threw it over the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has made with you. Out of all these words I have spoken. Then they climbed the mountain, Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abu, 70 of the elders of Israel, and saw the God of Israel. Now you may say, I thought God was invisible. How can they see God if God's invisible? God explains this, that he uses his glory cloud. Okay, God says, you can't see my face, but you can see my back. And then his, he caused his glory to go across. So the totally glory cloud. He was standing at the pavement of something like sapphires. This is interesting because you go to the, uh, the, the vision that Isaiah had, the vision that Ezekiel had, the vision that J John Revelation had, and you'll see similarities here. Send another paper of something like summer as pure, clear sky blue. He didn't hurt these pillar leaders of the Israelites. They were God, they saw God, they ate and drank. God said to Moses, climb higher up the mountain and wait there for me. I'll give you tablets of stone, the teachings and commandments that I've written to instruct them. So Moses got up, accompanied by Joshua his aid, and Moses climbed up the mountain of God. He told the elders of Israel, Wait for us here until we return. So you uh, return to you. You have Aaron and her with you. If there are any problems, go to them. Then Moses climbed the mountain. The cloud covered the mountain. The glory of God settled over Mount Sinai. The cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called out of the cloud to Moses in the view of the Israelites below. The glory of God looked like a raging fire at the top of the mountain. Moses entered the middle of the cloud and climbed the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. And there Moses disappears. And after 40 days and 40 nights, of course, you know, they said, he's gone. We don't know what happened to him. And that's why they did the golden cow. So that's another story. But here they have the people themselves. They have 70 leaders. They had then finally Joshua and his age, I mean, Moses and his age, Joshua went up further. They have this sense of great devotion, right? The sense of awe before God. And some of them were afraid of, of God, and they said, no, we don't want to go there, we're scared. It's, uh, and others, uh, uh, but God wasn't trying to hurt them, but he was insisting that 
They understand that this is holy and this is right. This is God's presence, okay? And they did they come up, Moses and Moses and Joshua going up into the cloud, into the mountains. And there is a sense of, of awe before God. There is a sense of fellowship. They're standing in God's presence and eating. Okay. And uh, then fight, and yet there is this great holy respect for God. So can we do some of this stuff? I mean, is it necessary for us to choose either to have good fellowship and good time and camaraderie and everybody get together and backslap and blah, 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 as if the church is just a club, or to have on the other side the holiness of God and do you better be scared before when you come up here because this is God speaking and you know they do both, you know. They're they are close to God, and God has his direction, his rules for doing it this way. And but the people, the people are coming into the presence of God. And I think I think uh, we can have a sense of, of you know, Truth and grace, how else do I put this, okay? Yeah. People who tend to emphasize grace, you know, in the church world, everything, uh, everything gets forgiven, it's easy believism, and, and we don't have a, have a standard behavior at all, you know, we just do whatever we feel like, that's the one side, and then there's the other truth, you know, and uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna <laughs> you know, buy the truth and sell it, not me. Eat this gospel like Ezekiel did, and so on. So it's a, uh, so it's a we're, yeah, but, but it's not either way like right. that. It's right. a sense of right. great reverence right. and awe and respect for God. Yeah. And yet, this God who has this power and holiness is not saying, "I'm here to kill you." He's saying. You know, come up into this present and he's willing to be with him and that, that. So let's put these two things together. You know, and both both sides of this, okay? That God is holy and God is also love. Right. Both yeah. are there. And you know, if God was only love but didn't what well, wasn't the great God, he might want to save us, but he couldn't. You know, he he couldn't forgive. He wouldn't be God. He would only God can forgive sins. And so, if he didn't have that, if he didn't have that justice and holiness and power, then he might love us, but he couldn't do anything for us, right? And if he was the other way, all power and austerity, and didn't care about us, yeah, he could do something, but he wouldn't want to. Okay, who cares about you? You said that's your problem. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, so you know, I'll, you know, uh, so we have really, really, really good news. Yeah, okay, right. Hinduism has 330 million gods, oh, and not one of them loves you enough to carry the penalty for your sins. Right, that's right. Okay, oh, right. we got that's good. one. We got the creator of the universe. Yes, the real, powerful, all powerful, all knowing, all. Okay. Yeah. That's good news. Okay. So let's share a bit about it here and everywhere. Uh,